take a moment uh, on this most holy of days to remind us and those who are joining us online also this morning in worship um, that those of us who are believers that we have been called out of darkness and into the glorious light and life of Christ we are no longer slaves to sin and the devil but we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus to walk in his most abundant life and be filled with the very same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead. First Peter 1, 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is what we celebrate this morning, family. Hallelujah. Amen. And welcome to those who are visiting with us this morning. We're so blessed to have you here. Um, in worship with us. If you feel comfortable in doing so, please fill out one of the visitor cards located in the seat back, back pocket in front of you. And uh, you can put it in the offering box in the foyer, and we'd just love to get to know you a little bit better. And as always, if you have a prayer request this week, please fill out that on the back of the card, and we'd just love to pray for you this week. Look in the announcements today for uh, life and the upcoming... Um, of events of our church family. And don't forget, if you haven't done so already, to sign up to help uh, with the Love God and Love uh, People Carnival that's to be held here on April 20th. Uh, Jean, uh, Jane says sign up, uh, everybody on board here. So sign up sheets are in the lobby. And also, it's uh, Phyllis says it's not too late to sign up for the three by three dinners. You can still do that. Um, and, uh, uh, the sign-ups are in the lobby also for that. I uh, want to remember that there's no Sunday school uh, today, and uh, Sunday school classes will resume next week. And remember to put on your calendars. We have a lot going on in our church. Uh, Wana Sunday, April 28th, and CF's uh, Christian Family Youth. Uh, lunch auction also on April 28th. And if you could just please sign up for that if you're going to come so we can know how much food to be. And this is to raise money for um, the summer mission trip that's going to be happening. Okay, are there any other announcements this morning that need to be brought before the congregation? Okay, well, if you're uh, able to, would you please stand with me now for the reading of God's holy word? 
be reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men, men in clothes They gleamed like lightning, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. As God's people, let us come now before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we have uh, come into your presence this morning because you have called us. You have called us from slavery to sin and death to become slaves of righteousness. And Lord, you have called us from darkness into the brilliance of your light. You have called us not only into your light, but you have called us to be light light in Christ to a broken and hurting world. And Lord, death could not hold you, and because of you, you the resurrection, we too can live. So we thank you that the grave is only a journey into your presence, Lord. And today we say with the Apostle Paul, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And Father, on this most holy day, we come as your children before before your throne giving you praise and adoration for the free gift of salvation given to us through your son, Jesus, by his great sacrifice for us on the cross. And Lord, we give you thanks with grateful hearts this morning for the gift of eternal life with you by our acceptance of your son as savior and asking for forgiveness of our sins in his name. And Lord, we pray for the lost, for the millions who only need to bow before you and with contrite hearts ask for this free gift by acceptance of your Son as Lord and Savior. And in this, this morning, Lord, we pray for our missionaries and all those spreading your gospel here at home and in the far reaches of your world, Lord. And as they worship you and give thanks to you on this day when we celebrate your resurrection, Jesus, we ask for protection and boldness for them as they continue to proclaim your gospel to the unreached to the broken and hurting world that can only be saved by turning their eyes and hearts to you. And Lord, we do thank you so much for this fellowship of believers, for continuing to bless us, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Guide us, lead us, humble us when we need to be humbled, Lord, for forgive our sometimes wicked ways, Lord. And Lord, we do pray for those in our congregation and outside of these walls who are ill in body and in spirit those whom we have prayed for this week, and we also give you praise for having our unspo- hearing our unspoken prayers, Lord. And Lord, we also continue to pray for our nation and our leaders. Be with pa- Brother Hayes as he departs in service to our country. Keep him safe. Please surround him with your angels. Give comfort to Tiffany during his absence. And Lord, we lift up... Uh, and ask you to be with Pastor Mike this morning as he brings us your word. Help us to receive your word with open hearts and then help us to take forth your word to our neighbors and to those around us. And now, Lord, please bring down the Holy Spirit among us. Fill us that we may have joy and service to you and to each other and in all that we do and say. For it is in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're, will, if you're able, please remain standing as we continue in worship. Say 
his foes. He arose a victor in the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to
Thank you. You may be seated. I'm reading from Romans chapter 6, starting verse 20. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that gift of eternal life is only possible because of God's amazing grace. <clears throat> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of his brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me All that you've done for me
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is speaking about our resurrection in Christ, which is only made possible because of Jesus' resurrection that we celebrate here today. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 54, Paul says, when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me invite you, if you're comfortable standing one more time, to sing with us a victory in Jesus. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. I loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing blood revealing. How he made the light to walk again and caused the light to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. Love me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And he heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and someday sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he taught me and bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Thank you. You may be seated, and the children are dismissed to Solid Rock Church. As we continue in worship this morning, hear the words of the Gospel of John from 
chapter 11, verses 21 through 27. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if he had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. This is the word of the Lord. As we come now together into God's word, let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this beautiful morning that you have given us, for the opportunity to come together this morning and lift our voices to sing of the victory that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we worship you. We know that this is all because of your mercy and grace that we can be saved. Lord, we know that we can come into your presence on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and that we can now approach your throne of glory, not by any merit or works of our own, but by what Jesus has done for us, by dying on the cross to forgive us of our sins, and by breaking free of death and the tomb to guarantee our eternal life. Lord, I do want to pray for a few things this morning happening in the life of our congregation. I want to give you praise for Ed Pellegrini's successful eye surgery earlier this week and just ask that you are with him as he has another in two weeks. I want to lift up Jenny Cassatt and her family and their friend uh, that has entered into hospice care. I just ask that you be with uh, their friend and, and that family. Uh, for Elizabeth Roten and for her sister, uh, who had to have an emergency surgery this week and is still recovering in the hospital, uh, we pray for her and ask for her full healing. Uh, for Joanne Truitt, a dear sister in Christ who's been diagnosed with a brain tumor, we pray for her and for her healing, for her family, and uh, just as they walk through this difficult time. I also pray for Jay and Linda Almquist, who are moving to Texas tomorrow. And uh, just pray that you are with them in their travels and in this next phase in their life. Lord, now I do want to especially pray that if there are any here this morning who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who do not have forgiveness of their sins and that hope of eternal life, I pray even now that your Holy Spirit would be working in them and that you would give us all ears to hear, and hearts to obey. I surrender my tongue to you, that these words would be yours and not mine. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we have the privilege of celebrating Resurrection Sunday this morning, uh, I want to look at Matthew's gospel and how Matthew records the events of that morning. And so I'd invite you to join me in Matthew 28. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in the seat bottom in front of you. Uh, Matthew is the first of the gospels, so at the very beginning of the New Testament. And chapter 28 is at the very end of Matthew. Our goal this morning is to look at all 20 verses here in Matthew 28, uh, which records... The empty tomb, the angel's message, the appearance of Jesus, the cover-up that the guards try to do, and the last instructions that Jesus gives to his disciples as recorded in Matthew. And so not only will we see what happened on that morning at the empty tomb, but we will be encouraged in how we should respond to those events. I'll begin reading Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Matthew writes, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. What an incredible passage this is. And as we look at this passage this morning that recounts the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want us to pay special attention to five imperatives, five commands that we are given in this text. There are five things that that the disciples, one of the things that the soldiers are told to do. And so the first of these, the first charge is found in verses 5 and 10. The women at the tomb are charged with these words, do not be afraid. Verse 1 introduces these two women who are central to this account in Matthew. It says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. We're familiar with Mary Magdalene. She was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Luke 8, 2 tells us that Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, and she is there with Jesus all along the way. The other Mary, which... It's kind of an unfortunate way to be described, isn't it? Uh, Mary was a very common name at that time. And if we were to look back just one chapter at Matthew 27, verse 56, there's another Mary named there who is the mother of James and Joseph, two of Jesus' disciples. And so this is likely her. These two women wait until it's appropriate to go to the tomb And when it's early in the morning, they go there. They were both at the crucifixion. They both witnessed the burial. And now they come to the tomb. Mark's gospel, the parallel account there in chapter 16, verse 1, records that the women came there with spices to anoint Jesus' body. Everything, uh, the events of the crucifixion happened so quickly that they couldn't properly anoint Jesus' body. They had to get him in the tomb before the Sabbath began. And now that the Sabbath was over, it was time to go and finish that job to give Jesus, at least his body, that honor that he was due. The fact that they bring the spices with them 
indicates to us that these women are fully expecting to get to the tomb and find a dead body there. In fact, other gospel accounts, they they talk about how the women are worried on the way. Who is going to roll the stone away for us so we can get in to do this job? What's amazing about that is Jesus, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, has predicted his death three times, but it also predicted his resurrection on the third day three times. He'd been very clear that he would die. The Son of Man would be delivered into the hands of the chief priests and the elders, into the hands of the Gentiles, that he would suffer, that he would be crucified, but that on the third day he would rise again. There's some people who, who look at this as, as, as a kind of shock amnesia. How when you go into shock, you forget about things that you have been told. And that's likely where these women were. They, they were so shocked at the death of Jesus Christ that they forgot the promise of his resurrection. Verses 2 to 4 describe the events that had already occurred at the tomb. Matthew's giving us a little bit of a flashback so that we understand that when the women arrive, they don't need to worry about who's going to roll that stone away. Because we see beginning in verse 2 that there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook And became like dead men. So we see that there was an earthquake. That there had been an earthquake at the crucifixion as well. We we saw an earthquake there when Jesus died. And that split rocks. That was such a huge earthquake that it opened other tombs. Matthew 27, 51 to 53 records that. But same on this morning. On this Sunday morning there was an earthquake. It just opened one tomb though. And whether the, the angel came down and rolled the tomb away or, or, the, tomb was, or the, the, the stone was rolled away by the result of the earthquake, we, we see, and I love this detail, that the stone is rolled back and the angel sat on it. it isn't that just such a, a, a man thing to do? When, <laughs> when you finish a project, I know I am this way. Um, I just want to point to, like, do you see what I've done? Do, do you see... And it's interesting, he's not so much directing attention at him rolling the stone away, but he's directing attention that this stone, which had been meant to seal the dead body of Jesus, the Messiah, in, was now only useful for a chair because the tomb was empty. And and he's drawing the attention to that. Now, this angel that is dispatched, we know he's an angel. Matthew tells us very clearly. He also gives us his appearance. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. This is how angels are described. They have just come from the presence of God. And in fact, other places in the Bible, we see that when people come from the presence of God, they are radiant in this way. Moses, after Moses met with God, he had to wear a veil because his face was so radiant that people couldn't stand to look at him. Jesus, when he was transfigured, the same way it describes his clothes and his face, they were radiant. And so the women come on this scene. They're expecting to find the sealed tomb. They're expecting to have to figure out how are we going to get it open so we can go in and anoint Jesus' body. And yet they come and they find an open tomb. The stone's been rolled away. The guards are all lying on the ground. And this angel is sitting on that stone. And it's no wonder that these events strike fear into their hearts. Which is why the angel's first words to the women are, Do not be afraid. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. The angel is saying, don't be afraid at what you are seeing here. Don't don't be afraid of my appearance. Don't be afraid of the circumstance that you are walking into. But more so, he's reminding them of that crucifixion. He he reminds them that, yes, Jesus was crucified, and this was likely a, a reason that their hearts were afraid. And so he's calming that fear as well. In fact, that's what he goes on to say in verse 6. This quantifies why they shouldn't be afraid. Why they have no need to fear. Because he is not here. 
He has risen just as He said. The women don't have to live in fear anymore because Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead. He's not just talking. The angel isn't just talking about right then and there. The angel is talking ahead and, and talking about how they don't need to be afraid of anything anymore because Jesus Christ has conquered death, has conquered sin. It's interesting that the, the women, they go off and, and we see them, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, when they do hurry away, they're still afraid in verse 8. And so it's amazing that when Jesus appears to them, his words are the same as the angels. He greets them and then he says the same thing. He tells them, do not be afraid. It would be one thing for the angel to say, don't be afraid. Look, he, he's not here, he has risen. But, but for Jesus to show up, that's a proof of this. And so not only in verse 5, but also in verse 10, we see that command, do not be afraid. And when you hear a command like that, do not be afraid, how do you tend to respond? If I'm honest, there's a great cause for fear in this world. You, you can't pick up the newspaper. You, you can't turn on the news and not be confronted with another new reason to fear. Another new thing that you need to be nervous about. I remember that, that when our firstborn, Lydia, was, was born and we were released from the hospital. Uh, first of all, it's, it's just a weird thing. Like, really? They trust us to be parents? They, they, they're going to trust us with this? But I vividly remember going out, getting the car, pulling it up to, to the doors of the hospital there and loading her in. And the moment I sat behind the wheel, I experienced something I'd never experienced before. Because now, all the other cars on the road were weapons. They were something that I was just afraid of. And I, and I did. I, 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 got, I kept my distance from everything. And, and there is a new reason to fear all the time. But we are told biblically time and time again that we do not need to fear. In fact, this is, this is one of those commands that shows up so often in the Bible. I read it once. That the command to not be afraid is in the Bible 365 times. Isn't that a coincidence? If you've been here for any length of time, you know how I feel about coincidences. There's no such thing. 365 times in the Bible, we see the command not to fear. And here today in Matthew's gospel, we are given the reason why we do not need to fear anything. And that is the fact that that tomb was empty that Jesus Christ defeated death. And so when you hear that command, do not be afraid. Are you living in fear? Do you need to listen to this? Does this need to speak into your life this morning? One of my favorite promises from Scripture helps us as we face these fearful situations. John 16, Jesus tells his disciples, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We see there that we will face trouble. We will find things to be afraid about, but we can confront those things without fear, not because we've got this figured out, not because we're bigger than those situations and circumstances, but because Jesus has overcome the world. Because Jesus has overcome sin and death and the grave. As the old hymn promises us, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And because I know he holds the future, life is worth the living just because he lives. Because Jesus Christ lives, we have no need to fear anything. And so that's that first command that the women are given, that first charge. They're quickly given a second charge, and, and this helps them overcome their fear. We find this in verse 6. And the angel tells the women there to come and see. He commands them not to fear. He proclaims the resurrection of Christ. He is not here. He is risen. And then he says, come and see the place where he lay. He encourages these two women to come into the tomb and see for themselves 
that it is empty. These women who, remember, had seen Jesus' body placed into that tomb. They'd seen the stone rolled to seal it. They knew he was there just three days before. And now the angel is saying, come and see. Come and evaluate this truth, this evidence for yourself. John chapter 20, verse 7 indicates that when the disciples then came, they went into the tomb and they saw the place where he lay. They saw the burial clothes that had been tightly wrapped around Jesus, that they were still there in the tomb, though there was no body. And I think it's incredible that John records that, that they, were, they were neatly placed there. It wasn't like a struggle had happened. If Jesus' body had been removed by grave robbers, which was a theory that persisted, do you think they would have taken the time to, to, to fold the clothes and then leave? No, they wouldn't have. If, if Jesus had, had somehow been torn out of those burial clothes. No, you would have seen that. But, but those clothes were there. They were folded. They were neatly placed there. And that was an evidence to these women who, who had seen the body placed there. They'd seen these grave clothes. And now there was no body. He wasn't in the tomb because he was alive. And this is compelling proof that Jesus had been raised from the dead just as he had promised. And so there's this invitation, this command to come and see. Evaluate the evidence for yourself. Come to the conclusion on your own. Look at the facts. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? In his book, The Case for Easter, one-time atheist turned Christian Lee Strobel writes about this. He evaluates many pieces of evidence historical evidence, biblical evidence, medical evidence, to prove the resurrection of Christ. And one of his key pieces of evidence is the empty tomb. There, there's no explanation other than that Jesus really did raise himself from the dead. And so the same call applies to us, to come and see. Evaluate this evidence for yourself. I would encourage you, if you've never thought through these things, if you hear this and, and you've never really wrestled with it in your mind and in your heart, come and see. Look at the evidence. In fact, I'd encourage you to come and see in the same way these women did, to, to evaluate that evidence, to see what, what is the big deal about the empty tomb. What is the big deal, as we're going to go on to see, that they actually saw Jesus. What's the big deal that he would appear, appear to hundreds of people at a time? Well, the big deal is that if you could explain this away somehow, then none of this would make any sense. Then none of this would give us any hope. But you can't explain away the empty tomb. You can't explain away Jesus' appearances to people. And some people have tried. They said things like, oh, well, they were just hallucinating. They, they were just overcome with grief, and they saw what they wanted to see. Which I could understand if it was just one person doing that, but you don't have group hallucinations that all match up. Jesus appeared at one point to over 500 people, and they remembered it the same way. That's not a hoax. That's not a hallucination. And so when you look at the evidence... And when you draw your own conclusions, you will see the truth of God's word, the truth of that empty tomb. And so I would charge you, if, if you've never worked through these things, if you've never thought through these things, if you've never wrestled with this in your heart, to come and see. Uh, look at what the gospel accounts say. I've got a couple copies, even in my office, of Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Easter. I'd love to give that to you. I'd love to answer questions. I'd encourage you to come back next week. We'll, we'll be here next week. We're going through the Gospel of Mark right now. And you can see who Jesus is and what he has done for us. You can come and see and draw your own conclusions. After telling the women to come and see... The next thing that the angel tells them to do is to be witnesses, to go and tell. Once they've wrestled through things on their own, once they've come to their conclusions, they are charged to go and tell. We see this in verse 7 and again repeated in verse 10. They've been told Jesus has risen from the dead. They've seen the empty tomb as proof of his resurrection. And so in verse 7, the angel says, Go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. 
There you will see him. Now I have told you. The angel gives them the message and gives them the task. Go quickly. Go to his disciples and tell them. Tell his disciples that he is alive, that he has risen from the dead. And then he's going to go ahead of you into Galilee. This is interesting because he'd already told them this. Jesus had told his disciples, Matthew 26, verse 32, he says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. They already knew this. But again, overcome with grief, overcome with sorrow, in the shock of Jesus' death, nobody was thinking clearly. And so these women were given the task of being the world's very first evangelists of the good news. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is what makes the gospel the good news. And they are charged to go quickly, go tell his disciples that he has indeed been raised from the dead. And I love the, their unswerving obedience that we see in verse 8. They did not hesitate to deliver this good news. Verse 8 reads, So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. They respond in obedience. They hurry away from the tomb. And again, it's, it's telling that Matthew would include that detail that they are afraid, yet they are filled with joy. They haven't totally gotten over their fear yet. They, they may still be stuck in that grief. They may still be stuck in that sorrow. They may still be overwhelmed by speaking to an angel or by seeing that empty tomb. They may be in that mindset of this is too good to be true. Is this, is this really possible? And yet we see that their joy at the good news overcomes their fear. Their joy overcomes and motivates them to go and tell. And it's on their way back to Jesus' disciples that they get another confirmation of that resurrection. Verses 9 and 10, Jesus shows up to them. And I just think this is so great and so gracious of Jesus to do. Because if they would have gone back with, with the message of the angel and the empty tomb, there may still have been lingering doubts in their minds. But could anybody deny that Jesus was raised from the dead after talking to him, after touching him, which is a detail that Matthew includes here? Verses 9 and 10, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Even more so than the empty tomb, the proof that Jesus has risen from the dead is found in his appearance. And the fact that they clasped his feet to worship him. They, they, they touched him. They, they were able to, to physically touch him. This wasn't a vision. This wasn't a hallucination. This wasn't a ghost. This was Jesus in the flesh. I wonder if as they were clasping his feet, that their nails brushed, that their fingers brushed the nail holes there, the scars that were there, and they knew that this was Jesus. A lot of times we give Thomas a bad rap, don't we? Because this is exactly what he wanted. He wasn't around the first time that Jesus appeared to his disciples. And Thomas said, unless I see him, unless I touch him, Unless I see the nail scars in his hands and feet, unless I put my hand on his side where that spear pierced him, I'm not going to believe this. That, that physical proof was necessary. And even the women are graciously given that proof here. And then after this proof, after his appearance, after they worship him, after they clasp his feet Jesus tells them the same thing that the angel had told them. He reiterates that message. He reinforces it. Again, he says, do not be afraid. And then he gives them that command, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. What's amazing about that is the way that Jesus refers to his disciples as brothers. Because if you remember the last time that Jesus and the disciples were together, the last time that Jesus saw the majority of his disciples was in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came for him. And some of them fought against those soldiers, but the majority of them turned tail and ran. And yet Jesus doesn't say, 
Go tell those doubters that I'm going to meet them. Go tell those losers that I'm going to go. meet just like I told them I would. No, he says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. What grace that Jesus displays here. What, what mercy in the way that he talks about those followers that had betrayed him, that had abandoned him. And yet, in his resurrection, he is reminding them through these women that everything happened just as he said it would. So after worshiping Jesus and confirming that the resurrection was real, the women have these commands repeated to them. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. They're to let go of their fear. They're they're to go to the disciples and share the news with them. What a wonderful thing Jesus has done for them in this. His presence is the balm for their fears. We sang it a couple weeks ago, Oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. And there's a line in that song that talks about Jesus' name casting out all fears. And that's what he's doing. He's there. His presence there puts them at peace. And it proves to them that he really has been raised from the dead. He charms their fears. He calms their fears. And encourages them in their charge. Go and tell. This is a charge. Go and tell. That is still something that applies to us today. If you are among the redeemed, think back. That means that somebody along the line in your life was obedient to this charge. Somebody obeyed and they went and they told you. You probably have an image of them in your head right now, whether it was a pastor or a parent or an evangelist or a friend. Somebody had the guts to tell you. Somebody was obedient to this command to go and tell. And your life has never been the same since then. They were a willing vessel for God to use in his plan of redemption. And, And you know, some of us look back and we think, well... I'm so thankful that they shared the gospel with me. I'm so thankful that they took the time to answer my questions, to walk through my doubts with me. Might God call you in a similar way? To to talk to somebody else? To answer their questions? To work through their doubts with them? To tell them about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ? Might God call to use you in a similar way to speak the truth of the gospel to someone in your life? Would you be equally willing? Would you go and tell if the Lord prompted you to do so? I'm going to take the if out of it. He has prompted you to do so. He tells us to go and tell. He, He commands us to take that light that he has given to us into a lost and dying and dark world. And so will you similarly go and tell the people in your life that need his help and his hope, his power and his peace, will you go and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ? I have to be honest here. It's true that not all people want to hear that good news. I get that. I've had my fair share of conversations where I don't have a nicer way to say it, but I've been told to shut up about my faith. I've had those conversations. You probably have, too. In fact, the world is so opposed to this, and I I know why. We'll talk about why. We even see it in this account. The opposition to the gospel springs up right away. And so in 11 through 15, Matthew 28, 11 through 15, we see the cover-up shown. What is it? What's the official story that's going to be told here? Well, the the soldiers, the guards who were there watching over the tomb, they were told, here's what you need to tell people. The cover-up is that the disciples stole the body. Jesus wasn't really resurrected. The disciples came while you were sleeping, And they moved a two-ton rock, and it didn't wake you up. And they stole the body, and and you know it was them, even though you were sleeping. See, that's where the logic falls apart for me. That's where this story, it just doesn't add up. But that's exactly what we see in these verses. Sometime after the women had left the tomb, these guards, they came to their senses. Verse 11 records what they did while the women were on their way. 
Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. The earlier verses in this chapter indicate that this account, all that they could have told the chief priests is about the earthquake and the angel. Because after that point, they were out cold. They shook and became like dead men. They didn't know about the women coming. They didn't know about the message of Jesus being raised from the dead. There was an earthquake. The angel came, rolled the stone away. They shook and became like dead men. But the religious leaders, they take this information and they conspire together. What are we going to tell people about this? What is the official report that we need to circulate? How can we best control this situation so, so that nobody gets the idea we don't want them to get? So, so that everybody still understands that, that, that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. That's what they're trying to do here. This is what they come up with. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night, stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. You understand what they're asking the soldiers to do, right? They're asking them to lie. This is a lie. You, you need to lie about this, and we're going to pay you off to lie about this. And we're also going to promise to keep you out of trouble because in this story, not only is it ridiculous that they would know that the disciples came to steal the body while they were asleep, even worse for these soldiers was the admission that they fell asleep on the job. In fact, we see this later in the book of Acts. Paul and Silas are in a Philippian prison and there's an earthquake there. And it, it looses the chains of all the prisoners. It opens all the doors. And the jailer rushes in. And he is about to kill himself. Have you ever wondered why he would do that? Because he knew he was a dead man anyway. He had been asleep on the job. And if any of these prisoners had escaped, it would be his life in exchange for theirs. And so even there, we understand that this is a big deal for them to admit that they had fallen asleep there on the job. And so these soldiers are told, we're going to pay you off to do this. The chief priest said, we'll handle the governor. We'll handle Pilate. If he finds out that you were sleeping, we'll smooth things over. You don't need to worry about the potential consequences of this story. All you need to do is lie for us. Lie and say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Just stick to that story. That's the official line we're giving you. Don't deviate from that. And we'll just keep you alive. And we will also keep you paid. Now there's an interesting thing here. And this didn't show up. I read a commentary that, that indicated this. That the idea that they will satisfy the governor. If the governor hears about this, we'll satisfy him. We'll keep you out of trouble. There's an implied threat there. If you change your story on this, then we're out. You're on your own if you start to change your story. We won't come between you and the governor anymore. And so they are coerced, and they are threatened, and they are bribed into this lie. Looking at those things, it's no wonder that verse 15 indicates the soldiers agree to perpetuate this cover-up. They're complicit. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. Just following orders, right? Just doing what I'm told to do. The soldiers took the money, that didn't hurt, and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Matthew indicates that the lie about the disciples stealing the body was still in circulation when he wrote his gospel. And indeed, this is a lie, this is a falsehood among others that's still in circulation today. That, that people, when confronted with the empty tomb, that's one of the lines that they go to. Oh, well, his disciples just came and took him. They, they took the body. They, they were the ones that, that facilitated this. The reason for this is that the father of lies, who Jesus said comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, he wants nothing more than for the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be discredited. And so there's fabrications like this. There's stories like this that, that demonstrate well, I don't know, maybe he wasn't raised from the dead. There, there's plenty of theories, and some of them, I mean, the, the disciples stood in the body, that's a ridiculous theory. 
I was studying one this week called the swoon theory, which indicated that Jesus on the cross, he was overcome by his wounds and he passed out and it looked like he was dead. And, and so they, they thought he was dead, they wrapped him up and in the damp and cool tomb, he revived and was suddenly strengthened enough to be able to break out of his tightly wrapped grave clothes, to be able to roll that stone away on his own. And he's out there delirious wandering around somewhere. That's what people believe. That's what people believe. When you look at the account of the gospel, how is that possible? Did they not remember that to check if Jesus was dead, the soldier thrust a spear into his sight, and there was a flow not only of blood, but also of water. Medically, when, when you are that close to death, there is a sack around your heart that fills with fluid. And, and that is an indication that it's over for you. And so when that spear entered Jesus' side and blood and water both flowed down, everybody knew he had really died. And yet there are so many falsehoods, so many lies circulating about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, this is because our enemy comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Whereas in that same passage in John 10, 10, Jesus explains that he has come, that Jesus has come, that they, his sheep, may have life and have it to the full. The lies about the resurrection still persist. The evidence proves to us that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so that final charge we're, we're getting to now in verses 16 and 20. After the disciples have settled it in their minds, here is what Jesus tells them to do. And here we see what we call the commission or the great commission. The final charge is for them to go and make disciples. This is almost the same as go and tell. Almost the same as that command that the women were given by the angel and then by Jesus. But they are told to go and make disciples. This portion of scripture begins with the obedience of the 11 remaining disciples, as well as a surprising detail. We see there in verse 16, that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So they go, they do go to Galilee. They've been told to go there to meet Jesus. They see him, they worship him. Maybe they clasp his feet in the same way that the women had done. But we see here that some of them are still struggling with doubt. And I gotta be honest, if this were some diabolical cover-up that the disciples were fabricating this story, why would we keep hearing about the fear? Why would we keep hearing about the doubt that they had? And further, if we look down the, the days of history, of these 11 remaining disciples, 10 of them died a martyr's death for the claims that they made about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One was sawn in half. Tradition holds that Peter was hung on a cross but upside down as, as not to be honored in the same way as his Lord. John was the only one that survived, and that wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. They tried to boil him alive, and he made it through that. They tried to exile him to the island of Patmos, and he survived that. He died in Ephesus later on. He was the only one that did not die for his faith, and yet they, they, they tried. I, I wonder, for these timid men who had fled when they came to take Jesus, don't you think that at least one of them would have broke under the threat? If you don't renounce Jesus... If you don't tell us that all of this is a sham, then we're going to kill you. And yet 10 of those 11 die for their faith. Even though they struggled with doubt, somewhere along the line, they understood that this was real. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened. And yet we see that doubt here. Luke 24 actually mentions that doubt three different times. When the women come back to the disciples, they doubt the women's report. When, when we're on the road to Emmaus, I thought the youth did a great job with their uh, play this morning on that. Those disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't believe Jesus' claims about the resurrection. 
Even in the upper room, when Jesus appeared to them out of thin air, locked doors, Jesus is suddenly among them. They didn't believe him until he voluntarily showed them the nail marks. And he ate a piece of broiled fish. Such a random detail, but it proves he was really there. Ghosts don't eat, hallucinations don't eat. He ate in their presence. He wants to assuage their doubts. He wants to prove that this really did happen. Now, what's amazing about this is we don't have an ending there. It doesn't end with, well, some of them doubt it. And I think it's amazing because doubt does not disqualify anyone from being charged to go and make disciples. He commands these same people who are doubting at this point, go tell others. Go tell others. And the amazing thing happens that when you do start sharing with other people, you have a passion to know more about what you believe yourself. That's an amazing, I want to call it a side effect to this. And this is what Jesus charges them to do. Verses 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love when we look at the Great Commission in full. Because not only do we have a command to go and make disciples, but it is bookended with Jesus reminding his disciples about the authority that he has and that he is bestowing upon them. And on the other end, he's reminding them, I'm going to be with you while you do this. I, I'm not just sending you out on your own. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He reminds his followers of the authority he now has because of, derived from, the resurrection. And he's giving them that authority. And it's almost like saying, remember, I'm the boss here. I've, I have all authority on heaven and earth. I've died and I've been raised again. If you didn't believe me before that I was the Messiah, the Son of God, surely you are beginning to believe me now. And because of that position, because of the authority I have, listen when I tell you to go and make disciples. When I tell you to baptize others into the name of the triune God. When I tell you to teach others to obey everything that I have commanded you. The process of making disciples, it begins with sharing the good news of Jesus. Telling what they'd experienced. Telling what they'd seen. Telling what Jesus had done by dying on the cross. And then being raised again on the third day. It continues in baptism, an act of obedience, by which a disciple symbolically identifies themselves with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And further, discipleship is an ongoing process of instruction, and it focuses on obedience. What did Jesus tell us to do? This is how we need to obey that. And Jesus finishes this charge with a reminder of his continued presence. This will strengthen the disciples. This will support them. This will motivate them as they carry out this task. So this morning, we've seen the account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the events surrounding it. We're faced with several charges given in this text. The charge to propagate the lies discrediting the resurrection, that's not one that applies to us today. But the others certainly do. The others to come and see. The others to do not fear. The others to go and tell, to go and make disciples. So as we close our time together this morning, I want to encourage you to take these charges seriously. Take these commands given in Scripture and understand that they still apply to us today. And so as you begin to personalize these, maybe you need to ask yourself, have I heeded the call to come and see? Have I evaluated? Have I weighed the evidence for myself? If you've never seriously considered who Jesus Christ is, come and see. The Bible that you may have picked out of the seat pocket in front of you, take it home with you. We've got others. We'll, fill, we'll figure it out. If you've never read through the Gospels, if you've never read about what Jesus has done for you, come and see. Evaluate that evidence for yourself. Or what about the command to not 
live in fear. Boy, this steps on toes, doesn't it? I know this world is a frightening place. We all face fears. We all face difficulties. But we must understand that believers in Jesus Christ truly have no good reason to live in fear. We know who conquered the grave. We know that our Redeemer is alive right now. We know that He gives us eternal life, those that follow Him, those that believe in Him. So take hold of this truth. Walk in faith. No longer should you walk in fear. And then finally, have you heeded the call to go and tell, to go and make disciples? Do you believe the good news of Jesus Christ enough to tell other people about it? Not only do we have an incredible story to tell, we have a true story to tell. We have a verifiable story to share with others. We have a relationship to show them that we know the one who forgives our sin. We know the one who has redeemed us. We know, as Jesus said about himself, we know the resurrection and the life. So we need to be willing to take that message of truth, of life, of hope to those who are hopelessly wandering in the dark. Wherever you are this morning, I encourage you to take these charges found in Matthew 28 seriously, to come and see. Do not fear. Go and tell and make disciples. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning especially for the empty tomb. Father, I pray that that would mean more to us now than maybe it did when we walked in this place together. That we would understand that because of that empty tomb, that we really should evaluate these claims. That we should come and see. That because of that empty tomb, we have no reason to fear. Because of that empty tomb, Lord, you have given us the task to go and tell others, to go and make disciples. Then you gave us that promise at the end when your son said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his presence and his motivation in our life and for the new life that he gives us even now. What a foretaste of the life that is to come in eternity. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we uh, celebrate that our Redeemer lives. Cause my
my Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. You lift my burden. Dancing on this mountain top to see your kingdom come. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. to invite Mr. Hayes Glenn uh, to join me here at the front. Um, as Steve prayed at the beginning of our service today, uh, Hayes will be deploying to serve a year in the U.S. military. Uh, he flies out next Sunday, and uh, we want to give him a send-off. We thought about a gift basket, but <laughs> this is a little more appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do this a little differently, though. Um, I can pray. I, I know I can pray, and I will pray. But I want us to pray. And so what I'm going to do, uh, Hayes, if you join me in the middle here, and now I'm going to make you stand up again, and, and circle up however you can um, to, to put hands on Hayes. That might mean you're putting a hand on a hand on a hand on an arm, and <laughs> however you're doing this. Um, but we just want to send Hayes off with, with God's blessing and God's protection. So would you join me as we pray? Father, I do thank you for our brother Hayes. Uh, we ask that you would keep him and the unit that he'll be with safe, that you would provide for his needs, that you would protect him, that you would use him in, in a ministry way too, as he is, is with these, these men and women who are protecting our freedom and protecting the freedom of others. Uh, Lord, we just pray for Hayes. We do ask your blessing upon him, and also for Tiffany, uh, we just ask that you would help us to come around her and surround her as, as family and be with her during this time. Uh, we do look forward to the day where you return Hayes to us and uh, just ask for his protection and his safety. And I'll close by reading out of Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know his love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Some